In this video, we're going to talk about how to run a construction project step by step. By the end of this video, you'll understand how running a construction project, whether it's large or complex, and running it well is very possible if you know the component parts of how to do it and the steps to do it. So we're gonna go through the two things that everybody on the construction project should know in order for them to be working as a collective team. The other thing that we get asked a lot is how do you know if you have the right team? And there's three things that you can use to determine, three ways to determine if you have the right people in the right seats. And when you have those people, how do you get them to communicate? There's two really key ways to get that done. And we're gonna show you that in this video. And then lastly, no matter how big this project is or how complex, there's one mindset, I would call it, that you must have as you go through so that you can make sure that you're fairly in a safe environment, meaning that you have all of your risks under control and that you can run that project effectively and then really go home and be able to sleep well at night because you have this one thing constantly under control. Okay, so let's get started. So first and foremost, project management is complex. I remember when I was first an assistant superintendent and then a superintendent, I thought that the construction process was, you know, it, it was pretty, it was extensive and it was overwhelming and I didn't know, you know, all of the ins and outs of what, how I should even just manage my area, right? And let alone the entire construction project. So I was like super zoomed in, focused on, you know, this part and that part. And am I going to get these all right? And I realized after doing a couple of projects, there really is a formula. And if you follow that magic formula, you can run a remarkable construction project. And so the projects that I was on typically were like, 50, 60, $100 million uh, projects, sometimes you know up in the 150, 250 million dollar range. And if you get them going right, they kind of start to run themselves. These keys that I'm about to show you will help you to do that. The other thing, probably some of you are asking yourself, well, Jason, that's fine, those are big projects. What about the small ones? I'm here by myself. I don't have a lot of help. I don't have a team. I don't have a system. Like you're talking about team members. It's just me, right? How can I, how can I use the same pattern to run small projects? And I will say, well, well, these patterns apply with the exception of maybe you don't have as many team members, right? But the point is I've run $200,000 projects, $2 million projects, $100 million projects, and the pattern is the same. But the bottom line, the thing that I want to uh, communicate is that if we don't follow these keys, we are going to get overwhelmed. We're not going to make it home on time. We're not going to be happy. We're probably going to suffer, and I and I mean this you know, sensitively, from some mild depression or some massive anxiety because we're really worried about how things are going to go. We're going to take on too much and do everything ourselves and just get worked into the ground and burn out. And so my first message in this video is that construction is complex and you can't do it all by yourself and you can't just dive in and start to tackle it uh, doing the tasks one by one. We need to follow the system step by step and then the system will enable the person, you, to go run that construction project well. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is understand the project. I know that sounds basic and you're like, Jason, you're wasting my time right now. But I'm telling you, we need to understand the project. And so the first thing you should do is get the drawings, flip through all of the pages, flip through the specs, and understand the prime agreement. So drawing specs, prime agreement, and get a general feel of what is it gonna to take to build this thing? Where is it? What are the circumstances? You know, when is it going to be done? And get that understanding. Now, uh, that's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of work. So here's the deal. Grind, get it done, get a caffeinated beverage, whatever you need to do. Get in there and dive in and figure that out. Now, I told you there's two things that your team is going to need to know. Now, number one, the typical details, the typical notes, and the specification items that you're most worried about. I'll give you a for instance. If you have an item where it says, hey, you can't strip these these cast in place walls until seven days, right? Or waterproofing may not be applied until 30 days after the fact, or you know any other really stringent requirement that could affect the schedule or the team or how you build it, you're going to want to pull those out and list those out so the project team knows. Then with the prime agreement, 
that agreement has certain provisions that might also include the division one specifications that will explain to the project team the requirements the owner's requirements for that project and that that prime agreement is super long but we need to get again pull out the critical items from those requirements from that agreement from those provisions and explain to the team hey watch out for these and watch out for these if we get this done we're a-okay let's work as a team and let's move forward so once you really understand the project and you have all that cataloged or listed out you're going to feel really confident and now you might feel that you can go you know conquer this thing by yourself that you can go slay this dragon by yourself but you can't the next step is you assemble the right team and there's a couple of ways that you know that you have good team members meaning that they're a fit for your construction project so the first one is the team members that you select and by the way you should spend as much time as you need to to assemble the team because it's always first who and then what assemble the team who's going to build this and then with the team you figure out what you're going to do so the first part of knowing if you have the right people is do your skills and your abilities and your personalities balance each other meaning if i'm like high level and I am a visionary, do I have somebody on my team that is an implementer that's detailed, that can really get down to the implementation, right? So if you're assembling a team, make sure that you have complementary skills. The second point to make sure that you have the right people in the right seats is are they a cultural fit? Not just with the company, which is really important, right? So the company's mission statement and the core values, that person has to be a cultural fit, but also a cultural fit for the owner, what they're expecting, and the team that's going to be on site. So really having a vision of what you want that to look like is going to be absolutely key. The third thing that you'll wanna focus on is making sure that you're hiring ideal team players. And ideal team players, like Patrick Lencioni says in his book, The Ideal Team Player, uh, they are humble, hungry, and smart. So humble, meaning that they're willing to dive in and dig in with the team to accomplish any, anything. Hungry, meaning from a career standpoint or a growth standpoint or a learning standpoint, they really, really just wanna win. They're gonna get in there and they're gonna get it done. And then smart means smart with people. It doesn't just mean technically smart. It means, hey, this person can actually coordinate, communicate with the owner, communicate with trades, communicate with the team. So those are the three things that we really want to hire for as you're assembling that team. And remember, assembling the team is your number one priority and the biggest determinant of whether or not that project will be successful. All right, so we're having fun here. I have four more key points for you as we go through the step-by-step -step process. But first, I'd like to ask you, if you like this content, please like and subscribe. We have about 10 million people in construction that we must get these messages out to so that we can elevate the industry together. So please again, like and subscribe. Love you. All right. So for my next point, I'm going to label it as divide and conquer. So I could, I could say something boring like make sure everybody has their right roles, but no, I'm just going to say divide and conquer. You cannot build this project by yourself. Even if you're on the project by yourself, you cannot build this project by yourself. So divide and conquer. I want to see beautiful, clearly written out uh, scorecards and roles for everyone on the job. What are you doing? What is the project manager doing? What is everybody else on the project doing? And make sure that every key role, every bit of supervision, every geographical area that's covered has somebody assigned to it, somebody running point. And that way you as a team can all stand where you are and lift where you stand, meaning run point where you are in your role and divide and conquer. This is one of the most important concepts that I could ever share with you, and it's not often done. So be absolutely clear with everybody's roles, even if that seems prescriptive, even if that seems like micromanaging, it's not, it's clear. And like Brene Brown says, clear is kind. We must be clear about this, so divide and conquer. Now that you have everybody in their proper roles, it's all about communication. I once talked to a, an international lean expert, and I mean, this, this guy is the real deal. And he consults with companies all around the world, huge companies. Um, and he says the number one thing that goes wrong in a, in a company uh, or a project or you know in a manufacturing facility it's all it always comes down to communication he said Jason communication is always the breakdown if something's failing and so you're going to want to really elevate your ability to communicate 
And once you have people in the right roles, now you need to communicate between those roles. And so there's two things that you can really do to elevate your communication. And number one is to hold remarkable meetings. Meetings are not bad. Meetings are not uh, horrible if you do them the right way. Meetings are where you get the team together, you communicate, and you're actually able to win as a team. In addition to meetings, you'll want proximity. Meaning that the more walls and doors you build between each other, the more barriers you have to communication. So you'll want to at least have time where you can spend uh, you, you know, time face to face or be in an open office environment or in a conference room or in brainstorming sessions or you know, even pull planning or scheduling together. Proximity is going to help you to increase that communication. So spend time together face to face. And so those two things, uh, meetings, Remarkable meetings, actually, I should say that again, not meetings, remarkable meetings and proximity, being together will increase that communication now that everybody has their roles. All right, two more. Once you have everyone uh, assigned to a portion of the project and we know who's running point and now we're communicating, the next thing we do is identify the biggest risks, meaning that if I've, I, if I've assigned somebody to a role or I know that they have a certain role on a project, I'm not gonna sleep well at night unless I know that the risks are covered. And I want everyone to see those risks, not just me. So I will, with the team, identify in a brainstorming session the biggest risks on the project. And I'll put that on what's called a risk and opportunity register. And we'll cover that in a different uh, video on this channel. But that risk and opportunity register will outline, hey, here are the risks of the project. Here are some opportunities. This is what it costs. This is how much it, it costs us by way of schedule. And here's who, who is running point. So as a leader, I can trust that most of the typical things are happening on the project, but I am going to check in and communicate with the team members about the risks. And I'm gonna monitor those with them and help them and coach them and train them and be with them and connect with them as they manage them themselves. So a great project manager, superintendent, or a great pro uh, construction leader or project leader will always know and manage their risks. And lastly, monitor the numbers. I want you to say something to yourself. I love numbers and numbers love me. I know that sounds silly, but say it again. I love numbers and numbers love me. You wanna know if something's going wrong, right? If I was unhealthy, like let's say I was at risk for something from a health standpoint, would I wanna know or not? I would wanna know, cause then I could do something about it, right? So not only are you monitoring your risks, but you're monitoring the numbers, you're monitoring the schedule, you're monitoring your buffers and your contingency, you're monitoring the finances, you're monitoring your gross profit, you're monitoring your contingency buckets. So to run a project really well, once you know the risks and you're mitigating those, then you're gonna ask yourself, are we doing well? We've, we've mitigated these, are we doing well now? Well, the only way to know is to do a blood test on the project, meaning like if I wanna be healthy, I go get a blood test and they look at the numbers and they're like, Jason, you're doing good, right? And so we do the same thing with the project. We do a blood test, we get the numbers and we say, are you doing good or are you not doing good? And if you're not, we can work as a team to really get that reined in and make a course correction. So I just wanna say again, uh, the numbers love you and you, you love the numbers. Uh, really to run a great construction project, you will want to know those. Okay, so here's a call to action for you. And the action is so that you can implement, right? Because knowledge is not power. Knowledge and action is power, right? So what I'd like you to do is take these points that are in the notes and actually go through each one of them and ask yourself, how well are you doing for each of these on a scale of one to 10? Right? So if you go into, you know, knowing the numbers, for example, how well do I know the numbers? Scale that, you know, zero being not at all, 10 being, <laughs> I've got some good numbers. I see everything on a daily or weekly basis, right? Scale yourself in there and then see with these steps, if there's anywhere you'd like to focus in the next 30, 60, 90 days. So that's uh, personally something that I would like to invite you to do so that you can elevate your leadership. And the last thing that I would say is that if you've enjoyed being here with me, and like I've enjoyed recording this for you, uh, please like the channel and subscribe because we'll have a ton of cool content coming in the future. So I have appreciated being with you. On we go.